If your company is remote or hybrid, then you know just how difficult it can be to grow your company's culture beyond a pre-scheduled Zoom happy hour or occasional lunch and learn. Well, this week's sponsor is here to solve that. They're called CultureBot. CultureBot has devised what will likely become the gold standard for growing and blossoming a company culture inside of Slack. The app is like a sidekick for any HR or people professional, automating a lot of the mundane tasks you probably are forgetting to do on a daily basis. Things like birthday and work anniversary celebrations, team shout outs and kudos, employee introductions, and remote games. It even has health and wellness tips and conversation starters. If that piques your interest, this will get you even more excited. Today, I'm able to share a special promotion for listeners of the podcast. You can get your first six months of CultureBot for 50% off. Plus, if your team is under 20 25 employees, CultureBot is free forever. So if you're looking for a way to create a culture of appreciation and drive increased engagement and togetherness across your team, I definitely recommend checking out CultureBot. Go to getculturebot.com slash humanhr. That's getculturebot.com slash humanhr to get the offer. Plus, I've added the link in the show notes so you can just click right there. Now let's get back to the podcast. Welcome to the Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources podcast. I'm Tracy Chernoff, and I've spent my entire professional career in HR. Each week, we'll explore the delicate balance between people and business with the aim to reconnect the two and create meaningful outcomes. Listen in as I share my own experiences, challenge the status quo, and chat with guests from various industries about our mission to bring the human back to human resources. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here for another week. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe. You can do it now. You can do it after the podcast ends, whatever. As long as you do it, I appreciate it. This week, I have a wonderful guest, actually the first guest of our uh, podcast to talk about HR design. And um, the guest that I have on today is Jody Brandstetter. She believes every HR professional needs to use design thinking methodology to solve complex HR challenges. With over 20 years of HR experience and a certification in design thinking, Jody is a guide to solving complex HR challenges with a creative and innovative method design thinking. Her first book, Hire by Design, is the playbook for strategic and intentional human-focused talent acquisition. Her second book, HR by Design, is the playbook for strategic and intentional human-focused op- people operations. In 2022, Jody founded By Design Brainery, a design thinking academy for HR professionals like us. Jody lives outside of Cincinnati, Ohio with her husband, Ron, daughter, Lena, and her fur children, Dolly and Jack. We love a shout out. Welcome to the podcast, Jody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat today. Oh my gosh, me too. And I love the names of your fur children. And of course, your daughter and your husband have equal shout out uh, credit on the podcast. But um, I think the names for your for your cats are very creative. Do you know why? <laughs> Do you know where I got the names from? I'm curious. I'm assuming that at least with Dolly, maybe you're an art fan, but I would love to hear the story. Yeah, so I um, am a huge art lover, and so all of my animals, except for one, have been named after my favorite artist. Um, mm. So my um, we just we talked about my fur baby who just passed away. Monet um, was named after Claude Monet, who is my favorite artist. Um, I'm obsessed with him. We have the same birthday, and then. Um, Dolly is um, Salvador Dolly, which I absolutely love his art. And then um, when I was living abroad in college, I found this amazing artist in Scotland, Jack Bertignano. Um, And so that's where Jack came from. And then the animal that didn't get named after an artist was my Cocker Spaniel, who when I met him, I found out his birthday was on St. Patrick's Day. And I was going to name him Sal for Salvador Dolly. And I'm like, I can't name him after (laughs) an artist not from, you know, Ireland. So I just went with whiskey and named him Jameson. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love that. You know, there's a there's a meaning behind every name. And I I really love the, the your your experience and your love for art. Did you study art? No. So I I did take some art 
classes in college. Uh, my mom is an artist. She does an amazing cartoons. She's, she wow. does beautiful work. And, um, but when I went to, when I studied abroad in England, I really started to appreciate art even more because there's so many amazing art galleries over there that you get to see and experience. So um, that was really kind of when it kind of triggered that I wanted to enjoy art and go see art. And, and um, you know, I think Monet was the first one that I fell in love with. Yeah. Well, oh, classic. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I like that. I love, you know, I know a few people who name their animals like sequentially after people that have kind of impacted their lives or for example, artists and it's really nice. And fur children are, you know, I, I'm a huge animal lover. So fur children are always welcome on the podcast and to make a special appearance as well. I don't know that we've actually ever had an animal on the podcast yet, but you know, never say never. So exactly. I did. I closed my door. So my four children will not be coming in. Thank goodness. Jack, the, the, the right. newest, everyone's out. Yeah. Jack, the newest edition would have totally walked across the screen and you would have all saw him. Um, cause he is very much a, um, uh, a lover of zoom. Oh, I love, you know, this, I've seen many a cattail grace the, the camera, um, from my colleagues. That's really funny. Well, maybe next time, Jack, we're thinking, we're, we're thinking yes. about you and your love for Zoom. Um, well, Jody, I would love to jump into this. Like I mentioned when introducing you, I don't think that I've ever had a guest on the podcast to talk about HR design, design thinking, and really like a methodical approach to these things. So I think we could probably start at the beginning. What is HR design? What is design thinking? And where do we start if we have maybe never had any exposure to these things? When, when you think about industries and, and fields of study, you know, there's always some sort of design approach to it. It's just, is it something that's more common versus something that you don't really see? It's maybe kind of just automatically kind of a part of the part of the industry or part of the field. So I think like with human resources, there's definitely a design approach that happens, but a lot of times we just don't see it or feel it um, because um, I think a lot of times HR departments are very similar. And so you see the same hmm. setup. Um, so I think, you know, with design, it really is trying to figure out, you know, how do you go from a to B to C, how do you ensure a, an experience, a process is going to work within um, your organization? Um, so that's, you know, kind of the design approach. Design thinking takes the design of a product, an experience, a process, and really focuses on the human, human side as well as the business side. Um, so it kind of links the two together. You know, when you think about a business, a lot of times people just really focus on the business plan or the objectives of the business. What are the goals um, when, you know, all of that is very much impacted by the people. So you really have to understand yeah. your people in order to pull out the work and the knowledge and the experience that you want them to bring to the organization to meet those goals. And so design thinking is a methodology that helps you with solving problems or helping um, enhance experiences that really work for the person as well as the business. Um, a lot of people see design thinking mostly in app development because um, there's a big, hmm. big component, right? There's a user interface. Um, you really need a person to want to go to that app and to use that app. Um, yeah. So you see it more in the technology side of the world. But it works really well when there's experiences and processes within a department. Um, and that's where the HR part becomes kind of that no brainer that we should be at least looking at pieces of the HR area in the lens of design thinking. So looking at it saying, yeah. is this process, is this experience desirable? So does it work for the person? And then for the business, is it feasible? And is it, I already lost my... I always forget my desirable, feasible, and ah, I just had it in my brain. But it really, nice. it really helps us not just look at one side of things. You know, it really lets us holistically look at what we're doing 
as an HR department to really impact our employees as well as the business. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, you know, I had an opportunity to look at your website, at least the By Design Brainery website. And I know that you offer courses and you um, really help to educate, and there are SHRM credits available for this as well, but that you help to educate folks who maybe have not had this type of exposure on the job, so to speak. Um, and that there is, it, it's interesting that you talk about how prevalent this is in other industries, especially in, um, like developer and tech jobs, for example, or engineering jobs, maybe, um, because there is so much of that, like, okay, what's our goal? And let's work backwards. What's, you know, uh, what is it called? I guess it's, um, retro planning. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that, like ability to retro plan is even understanding like the, the, parts of the project that you have, like the milestones, I guess, that you have to hit in order for your goals to be achieved. And I guess, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can really apply this probably anywhere within careers, especially in HR careers, because we're constantly looking at problems and solving them or um, and solving them potentially with new technology or new resources that require a rollout plan, a strategy, and things like that. So I would imagine that this design thinking is not just um, about like the holistic organizational development, but also how you are solving problems. Absolutely. I mean, if you are dealing with people, design thinking can work for you. I mean, hands down, <laughs> right. the whole point, like when you see trouble in customer service or, you know, let's go ahead and just, you know, kind of talk about maybe the Southwest situation that just happened with all the delays. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. those issues are based off of communication and the issues with communication is because you don't understand the other person's perspective. Therefore, um, the empathy you're showing may not be the right empathy or you may lack empathy altogether. But if you can understand who you're working with, who your customer is, what they're looking for, how they think that will help you build a better business. And so that's what design thinking does. And if you're in a science, yeah. technology, engineering, manufacturing organization, I guarantee other parts of your company are using a methodology may not be design thinking. It might be lean, for example, but they're using a methodology. That means they understand what a methodology can do. And so if you bring a methodology mm -hmm. into your department, it can show credibility. It can help them understand that you are also going through these different steps to truly make sure what you're doing for the organization is going to work. And so a lot of times when I go into specifically kind of that STEM area, when I instantly say design thinking, they understand it and they know what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm. And so it really helps them say like, oh, she has a plan. <laughs> she actually has steps she's going to go through. Yeah. I think a lot of times there's assumptions about HR that we just kind of make decisions mm -hmm. or, you know, we're the, we're yes. the party police or, you know, we, we're the nil when actually, you know, we help with risk. We help with making sure a business can stay um, up and running, um, but they, they don't see how our minds work. And so having something that is similar to what they use on how you're creating your HR strategy or your talent acquisition plan, your workforce planning really will help them probably connect the dots and see that you are an asset to the organization. Yes. I love that. Now you have just preached many, uh, pieces of this puzzle that I have been preaching for now the last like two, two or so years, two and a half years, depending on when this episode comes out, um, which is that there are some hefty stigmas against HR, which just means that we have a steeper hill to climb when we are solving these problems and we are, you know, kind of promoting different solutions. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, there, we are not just making decisions and there is really an element of strategy, a huge element of strategy that we have to, if we're not already, we have to implement in order to really not only be credible, but also ensure that our decisions are actually supporting and solving, supporting the organization and solving problems within the organization or for whomever the subject is in the case that we're solving for. And, you know, on top of this, when I think about the challenges that we face at an HR level. I actually uh, recently at the end of 2022, I shared 
in an episode, I think it was actually probably one of the last episodes of 2022, where there was this um, thought leadership out on LinkedIn saying that all of the tech layoffs at the in Q4 of 2022 could potentially be a result of HR decision making and um, that there was like a lack of strategic thinking and a lack of preparedness, a lack of budgeting. And I, I t- if you've listened to any of my podcast episodes, which is not a prerequisite to being a guest on the podcast, I should add, I am pretty outspoken and pretty direct about my opinions. And my opinion in this case was like, that's totally inaccurate. And that in actually, unfortunately, came from an HR person who was saying this. But basically, what I'm getting at here is that We are not just making decisions at HR, and we're certainly not making them without involving our stakeholders in the process. And so when you talk about how design thinking can help us make more informed decisions and um, to ensure that our decisions are well thought out and have um, risk assessment built in and have some element of uh, assurance built in as well, you know, it definitely um, underscores that point that I had made, you know, back in 2022 that we can't just blame HR for unfortunate circumstances in an organization. I've never in my HR career ever had the capability of making a layoff decision. (laughs) That that has never Mm -hmm. been my decision. Even even for my mm-hmm. own team, it was never my layoff decision. Mm-hmm. It was a business decision that then HR has to be able to handle appropriately. Right. Now, does that mean the CHRO exactly. wasn't a part of the conversation? Absolutely. The CHRO was, CHRO was probably a part of the conversation about these layoffs, but I, it's not a one person decision. Like, I, I don't care. I, I can't even just blame right. Elon Musk for the Twitter issues, right? Like, you cannot blame <laughs> one person. Did he have probably a big impact? Absolutely. He is the owner and he is the decision maker, like overall decision maker. But there's all these mm-hmm. other people who are making decisions as well within an organization. So, and and I personally yes. think the hardest part of HR is workforce planning. It is so hard to understand how many people you truly yeah. need in order to make a business run. Because because every person's different. You have your A players who are, you know, those go-getters who just get things done super fast and, you know, and just kind of run and, and go. Um, and that's great sometimes, right? Not always perfect. You know, sometimes you want that person to think, sit down, maybe have, you know, kind of let things kind of simmer yeah. before making decisions, right? But each person's so different in how they work. And that makes it hard to determine, well, how many people do I need on my team? Um, and then determine it. And, and we use all these, you know, I like these number crunching and, you know, you have accountants trying to figure out how many people we need in an organization and we, we don't get it right every time. Yeah. But what we can get right is how we handle that situation afterwards. How do we communicate that layoff? How do we do it in a way that is respectful to the people, but also respectful to the business, because you also don't want to lay off just anyone and everyone, and then your business is impacted. You know, I've heard so many times where someone leaves and there's no, um, there's no like actual time to digest like what they know before they leave. And all of a sudden you lose a key critical piece of your business because someone leaves. So, you know, there's there's a piece to it, yeah. too, that could really impact the business when you do layoffs or when people leave the organization that, you know, retaining that knowledge is so important. Um, so it's 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 not it's it, right. anyone who thinks this world is black and white is crazy because it is gray. It is mucky. Yeah. <laughs> it is nothing but black and white. It is. There's so many layers to us as a human that we can't just immediately say it's an HR problem or it's a business problem. It's all of our problem. You know, if we're laying off tons of people at the end of the year, that is all of our issues. And we all need to come together and figure out what did we do wrong? How can we ensure this doesn't happen next year? Because there's a lot of negative um, marketing that happen if you're consistently that organization laying people off every winter. It's important for any business to focus on their culture, employee well-being, and strategic growth. But without the proper tools, it can be next to impossible to support the people behind your success. 
That's why you need Namely, the all-in-one HR solution that empowers you to engage and develop your people in an intuitive platform. Namely's award-winning technology covers your essential HR, payroll, and compliance needs all in one place. Whether you have 50 or 1,000 employees, Namely's modern and integrated platform is designed to be used by everyone every day. With a mobile app and elegant UI, Namely empowers employees with self-service tools to request PTO, acknowledge peers, review pay stubs, and enroll in benefits. Namely helps you easily handle everything from onboarding, payroll, time tracking, open enrollment, employee engagement, and so much more. So you can get the time and data you need to drive the initiatives your company really cares about. I want you to simplify your HR processes with Namely, so I've arranged a special offer for my listeners. So right now, get a free month of unlimited access to Namely's all-in-one HR platform, but only when you go to namely.com slash human HR. Remember, go to namely.com slash human HR for your free month today. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. If it, I, I can't imagine. I mean, actually, we saw this from better.com. They went through one phase of layoffs and then they went through another but that's, it's horrible. And, you know, I totally agree with you that it's all about how we handle these things. And on the other side of things too, I don't think I've ever worked for an organization that felt like we got staffing a hundred percent right. Like, I don't know that I can think about a time where it was like, yeah, we have the perfect amount of people and we have the right head count and like no one is overstretched or underworked. Like, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. <laughs> Never. I wish it, I, like even, even, even as an entrepreneur, I don't get that. And sometimes I work alone and I still don't think I have enough people. Um, you know, I just, it's just, yeah. it's so hard to determine and you don't know what's going to happen from day to day. And I think that's where, you know, we definitely have to give grace. And I think grace is something that we don't do really well anymore. Um, as humans. So, you know, being able to say, you know, we didn't get it right this time, but we're going to learn from it. You know, I think that's where another mm -hmm. piece that a lot of times we don't see leadership talking about their failures and how they learned from those failures and then working through them and then being able to make a new solution. You know, I think as an employee, a lot of times you feel like they're going around in a circle. You know, I always joke mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in recruiting, a lot of times companies go, I have a great idea. We're going to outsource recruiting and mm -hmm. we're going to go take it to an RPO model. And that can work sometimes. Um, but then it doesn't work. And then they bring it back in house for, you know, maybe 10 more years. And then someone else comes and says, I have a great idea. We're going to outsource recruiting. And so it feels like this vicious cycle, right? We're just constantly mm -hmm. going back and forth and back and forth when there's more to that conversation. There's more to what their decision making, making is, but we don't know it as employees. So we don't see it. So we don't understand it. So again, we don't have the perspective of the leader and right. therefore we make assumptions. And then those assumptions can cause us to leave an organization. It could cause us to the, the new wonderful quiet quitting um, perspective. There's all these different layers that as an employee, we could, we it could impact us. So if we have um, really high engagement. We have a lot of communication from our leaders that could actually skyrocket our performance. But if it's the opposite, it could definitely take us down where we are. We're not as focused. We're not as concerned. Um, and then that impacts customers, which impacts the business, which impacts the success. Right. You know, it's it, all of this. I, I'm like nodding my head for anyone that's not watching the podcast. I am nodding my head to everything Jody is saying because really this like cyclical understanding of how organizations have like really ebb and flow is so important, not only for us as HR professionals, but also as employees because we are both. And, you know, I think about this idea of like having context before making decisions. This is like probably the first lesson that was ever shared with me that I was ever taught in my working career, like after, after college, which was that you have to get the buy-in from people, for example, before you really go and lead them. And what does that mean? It's, it's like, you have to establish a relationship. You have to understand who is working with you and for you before you can really 
jump in in most cases. Now, of course, I'm sure we're all thinking about times where we were tasked with jumping into something, solving a problem really quickly, and maybe having to forego the buy-in process. But you can still lead with uh, a, an element of like, hey, I have to, th- I'm tasked with this, but I also really care about you know, everyone involved and, and I care about the context. And this idea of like the perception of people who have um, come into the business, uh, solved problems or made changes, and then they've left and we're losing that knowledge. That context is so important when new people come in or people are solving new problems. And so when I think about this methodology, um, even from a like a gathering information stage, I, it makes me think about, of course, the hiring process, which I know um, was a, a, a major part of your first book, but also it remains a huge challenge for all of us today because of this quote unquote tight labor market, which is really broken down into a lot of jobs, not a lot of um, people looking for jobs in necessarily those jobs, but then also a lot of people in the job market. And it's like this perplexing uh, almost like calculus uh, equation when really there probably is something of a simpler solution when we think about how we can design the methodology to solve these problems. So in sharing all of that, getting the context, the hiring piece, like what are some what are some piece of pieces of advice, I guess, that you have for folks who are challenged with needing to solve these major problems that potentially have not been solved for now for possibly over a year. What, what do they do? How do they take a new approach? Yeah, I think that um, there's so many challenges that we have right now um, in people operations yes. and in business. I mean, we have the technology boom. We have, yes, the, the skills gap. We have um, limited, you know, people that might want your, your position. Um, you know, I think right. that you know, I, I've been in recruiting for over 20 years. So I've seen a, a lot of the, the changes. Like I, I started off with a fax machine, getting resumes mm, to, you wow. know, to today where, you know, someone could text me and I could use that as the resume. You know, it's just crazy to, to think about all the changes we've had in 20 years as an organization. And I think that, you know, when you're looking at some of these challenges, it's nice, again, to have a methodology, a process to kind of filter the, pro- the challenge through. That way you can really come up with some really creative, innovative ways to solve these problems. And so like mm-hmm. with, the, with the design thinking approach, you know, there, there's really kind of three key areas. Um, the first part is understanding the audience. And I think when you look at the hiring challenges, you know, Every, I always joke, like, you know, they always say, you know, there's always that joke, like how many people does it take to, you know, to do the light bulb thing? And mm-hmm. it, you know, I always joke, it's like, how many people do you need to, you know, um, talk to or how many candidates do you need to, to hire a person? And the answer is one, you need one person, one person with the skill set. And so a lot of times we're so focused on, I need to see three people. I need to at least talk to five people. Mm-hmm. I need, when actually it's like, okay, if we can change that mindset. I think that would help recruiting a lot (laughs) if we could get hiring managers to realize that the first person might be the best person and just to go with it. Like there's, you know, we don't have to compare and contrast every single person (laughs) that goes through the candidate for the hiring process. Really? Yes. This is a very compelling point that I have seen so many hiring processes delayed because there's a fear that there's someone better out there. Who cares? There might be someone better out there. But if you've got a great candidate, hire them for God's sake. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times that person leaves. That person gets another job. Yeah. And then instead of finding a better person, you're actually stuck looking for 30, 60, 90 more days when you had the person immediately. And and mm-hmm. you know what that actually means? And I, I'm going to cuss, so I apologize. So I'm going to go ahead and let people know ahead of time. That means you have a damn good recruiter. That's what you have right there. If the first candidate is the best candidate, you better retain that recruiter because he or she knows what they're doing. They know Mm -hmm. who you are, what you're looking for, and who's going to be the best fit for you. And they found that person and delivered it immediately to you. That is phenomenal work. That does not happen very often. Instead of being concerned about it, you should applaud it. (laughs) You should be like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Thank you for finding this person so 
quickly for me and that you understood exactly what I was looking for, you know, that's actually really good work. It's, it's not, you know, it's not like we literally, yes. again, a lot of people think recruiters just, you know, somehow poof, candidates come and they deliver them to you. There's so much mm -hmm. work, so much work to find that, that really strong candidate. And if they do it in the yes. first round, oh, oh, keep that person, make them feel good about themselves. Yes. They are a wonderful recruiter. They are magic. Let them do their magic. Um, but yes. <laughs> sorry, we went on a tangent. Like that, that's one of my biggest, I love that. my biggest pet peeves because it is like, I, I see so many and, and I have, and I will say, um, within, um, my clients that I work with, I have seen a shift. I have seen a shift where they are starting to recognize that it's okay to hire that first person. So I think having this experience of the lack of candidate pool, um, for them has really helped them understand that they can't, you know, just, you know, consistently look for the next best thing. You know, if they have a really good candidate, they go with it. But, right. but if we go through that, it's not like, it's, it's not magical what that recruiter did. What that recruiter did was they understood their audience, which is number one, first, one of the first steps in design thinking. And so for that, that person, they understood what the hiring manager was looking for, what the business needed um, in that role. They also understood the candidate's perspective, what they needed in a role. They were able to be that matchmaker to find the right person for the right role for the right, for the right hiring manager. And so that's really big. If you can just do the understand your audience step in design thinking in HR, you're going to, you're just going to be in this different level of, of being able to serve your organization. Um, and then the second piece is the brainstorming, giving yourself the ability to think outside the box, be creative, you know, come up with all these different ideas and kind of figure out which one's the best one to, you know, maybe move forward with. And then the third step I think is really important is, yeah. is the iteration of design thinking, which is creating a prototype. And whenever I say prototype, a lot of times I see HR people freak out like, oh my gosh, she's talking technical. <laughs> a prototype is, <laughs> is a draft. It is a um, mock-up. <laughs> it is a Excel sheet with your process on it. It's just a super easy way to get that idea out for people to review. But doing that and gaining feedback again really helps you solidify a solution that's going to work. And so if we do this with some of the challenges that we're seeing in an organization and, and really focusing on that business and that human perspective, we will be able to change our organization and change the world because we're really thinking about the person. And I think a lot of times we go back to, well, you know, Jack Welsh said this back in 1980s or, you know, this person, you know, did this and this is how it works we as humans have been evolving this whole time. So a solution from the past doesn't always work in the future. So that's where this creative, in, this creative innovative brainstorming ideation piece is really impactful because that's where you can really maybe come up with a solution that's going to work for today. I love that. And it's really a great point that just because it worked even six months ago, potentially doesn't mean it's going to work today and how do we um how do we continue to learn and i remember seeing on your linkedin that you had shared a quote about how if we're not continuously learning we've already basically aged out of the the context of the world it doesn't matter what age you actually are but that you can continue to learn and i don't remember if that was your quote or if it was a quote borrowed from someone but <laughs> Um, I thought that was like really, yeah, it's a Chinese pro proverb. I think, <laughs> I think it's a Chinese proverb, Oh, I but it is. It. I mean, I, 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 I look at, if I look at, you know, I've been doing a lot of self-discovery for myself the last um, year or so, because um, as an entrepreneur, you, you know, there's a lot of imposter syndrome. There's a lot of uncertainty oh. about who you are and what you do. Like, I mean, you, you're, you know, you, you constantly, I mean, as a recruiter, I've gotten rejected my whole life. So I, I really don't mind when people tell me no, um, cause I've learned how to deal with that, um, being a recruiter, but 
Right. But there's that self-discovery is part of learning. So, you know, I think a lot of people are like, when I want to take another class, like I've already, I've already gone through college, you know, like I don't want to keep learning or, or I don't want to read a book. And it's like, you don't have to read a book now. There's these amazing podcasts. There's like TikTok. I mean, how many people thought you were going to learn stuff from TikTok when TikTok came? And it's, it's amazing information that's learning. So if you, if you're learning about yourself, if you're learning about your industry, if you're learning about business, whatever it is, you you have to, you have to do that. Like you cannot stay stagnant. You stay stagnant and you're going to be a dinosaur. Um, so I think that that's the other yeah. piece again to like a design thinking approach is that you're constantly trying to learn about others. You're con- constantly trying to learn about different ways of doing things. Um, and that really kind of helps you stay, stay relevant and also helps you stay um, forward thinking with your organization. Yes. Yes, I love that. And when we think about how we institute changes and apply a design thinking methodology to the answers that we are hoping to propose to our organizations, I mean, you have to you have to be five steps ahead, potentially thinking five years ahead. You have to be able to uh, align yourself with modern context, learn from the past. I mean, we are like we're like shapeshifters and time travelers all at the same time. You have to be able to do all of these things, and and I think you can only do that if you're actively learning. I, I've talked about on the podcast before that I've had my own run-ins with challenging leaders, including those in HR, and I would say that the common denominator is that there's there was no interest in learning or adapting or changing and. At some point, you're going to watch the ship sail away and you're not even going to be able to relate your own uh, responsibilities to the modern context or the current context of your organization. And I think that it is a huge part of not only problem solving, but design methodology and design thinking. The other thing is, is a lot of times we talk about you doing the self-discovery, being the learner. Um, when you're the, when you're a leader and you have, let's say 10 employees, oh my gosh, how amazing would it be if all 10 came up and gave you knowledge that you never had before because you gifted them the time of learning, you know? So, so you have to be strategic on how you approach your team and learning because it's not only going to help them, it's going to help you. And, you know, the one thing I always, um, get so annoyed with, again, as a recruiter, I always have my recruiter hat on is when, you know, when a hiring manager doesn't want to hire someone who's better than them. And I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know how awesome it is? If you find someone who's better than you, you brought that person in organization, you show the organization, this amazing person, like how amazing, oh, I would love to be able to hire, like have that person on my team who shines. I want them to shine because that, that, that reflection doesn't put me in the shadow. It puts me right in the spotlight with them. So if you're thinking like, oh, if I give Joe Schmo or Jane Doe that opportunity to learn and they're going to, you know, bring all this new wealth of information and it's going to, you know, rain on my parade, then you're never going to be a solid leader you're never going to help your organization grow. You have to look at it as an extension of yourself. Like if I help Jane Doe or Joe Schmo get this, oh my gosh, how amazing is it? I'm helping them with their career. I'm helping my business. And that's all going to shine on me just as much as it's going to shine on them. Absolutely. You (laughs) heard it here first. That is a thousand percent true. And really, quite frankly, if someone is is uh, threatened by someone smarter than them, then they I mean, they are just not going to grow and they're probably going to stay stagnant their entire lives. There's always going mm-hmm. to be someone smarter in the room. And those are the people that you want. Yeah. You want to learn from those people, whether they work for you or you're working for them in the moment. I mean, we we have to be able to see beyond the tips of our nose, really, or noses, and and be able to see where value is added, and not feel so um, so easily threatened by people who might have better answers, better ideas, have a better background. Like those are the people who are going to change the organization, and or at least influence the organization with others. And I think you brought up a great point that when we think about who is getting the recognition there? Obviously the person who we're talking about here, the, you know, the hiree who is smarter than us, they are getting the recognition, 
that the team is also getting the recognition, the department that they work for, the organization. I mean, it's better for everyone to to really have this thought process and this ideology that you are not the smartest person and your ideas are not the best. And we have to kind of check our egos at the door in order to yeah, be able to absolutely. think that way. And, and it's, it's, it's so interesting again yeah. to, to think about this because again, it's, it's, it's oh, it always goes back to the other person's perspective, being under understanding of who they are and, mm -hmm. and helping, you know, also understand who we are too. Like having that knowledge is so powerful. And, you know, I think about, you know, again, through my um, self-discovery, like one of the things I've always had a hard time with is delegation. I love doing everything myself. I'm such that type A doer person, mm -hmm. but I, I have to sit back and think about, do I always want to be the doer? Do I always want to be the doer or would I rather have an extremely smart person on my team who I can delegate some of these pieces to so that I can be strategic, so I can be the visionary, so I can, you know, retire. You know, there's so many other, like if you take that and think about it in a, a larger um, frame, you're going to see that it's going to be better for you in the long run. It might be hard. You might, yeah, you mm -hmm. might. We're always jealous of jealousy is part of our, again, about human nature. Um, but if we can overcome that and accept right. that, you know, someone is better than us and that's a good thing. And how can we help them continue to be better? How can we keep them engaged and excited and, and wanting to work with me? Then I might get to retire or I might be able to move into this really cool role I've always wanted to be in, but I've only been the person who's been able to do this job, right? I mean, there's so many things that you could be helping others right. that also impact you. Absolutely. Um, I, I honestly, I think that you're adding so much value to our perspectives here and and I think for all the listeners who the majority are in HR, but there are certainly are folks who are looking to break into HR or who are considering HR as a career or who maybe are at the beginnings or the ends of their careers. You know, this, this understanding that we all as human beings bring different strengths and opportunities to the table and there is this, it's almost like a song and dance. Like there's a way to tango with one another. Um, I always have some random uh, analogy for everyone, every episode I feel like, but you know, there's always that, that having to feel someone out and figure out like, what are they really good at? What, what are they maybe struggling with? Do we put people in positions that adhere to their strengths? How do we grow their opportunities so that they become less of an opportunity and more of a strength, right? And like all of this like awareness that we have to have about human nature does help us in making those decisions. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit because I have a bit of a methodical question. I get a lot of messages about HR being very lean and people writing in saying, I'm a team of one or I'm a team of three and there's so much work to be done and there aren't enough of us. And we've already talked about how organizationally, you and I have never, ever, ever experienced a time where as far as staffing goes, we felt a hundred percent staffed at the right moment in the right way with the right, uh, you know, staffing methodology. Now, how do we apply design thinking to a, a department like HR that is so often understaffed, potentially more understaffed than any other understaffed department? And, you know, you can look up online, like, you know, what the headcount to HR professional ratio should be. And there are all these different answers, 150 employees to one HR professional, 300 employees to one HR professional. I couldn't imagine having 300 employees and being the only person, but nevertheless, what, what have you seen from a design thinking perspective? Um, what have you seen work in this type of instance where someone is trying to influence the actual headcount and development of their department. Yeah, as I think that um, the first step I would, I would do is really understand the blueprint of your HR organization. What are, what is your team or what are you, if you're an HR person of one responsible for, like, what are the key pieces, key initiatives or key areas. So, you know, it could be comp and benefits, 
recruiting, it could be employee retention. I mean, there's so many different parts of HR, but what are you or your team responsible for? And then I would look at, okay, what, what do we have to help in those areas? So if we go with my, my love of recruiting, you know, it could be like, okay, well, we have an applicant tracking system and we have, um, let's just say, um, you know, staffing vendors that we use occasionally. So that that's the support we have in that area. Okay, is that enough? Does it work? Are we totally utilizing those two items? So are you, you know, as having a consulting business, I work with a lot of companies who ask me to hire for them and I'm, I'm finally retiring from hiring. Like I'm finally taking my recruiter hat off and putting my, my teacher hat on. That's what by design brainery is doing for me um, professionally. But a lot of times we don't utilize what we have to the fullest. So that would be the first thing I would do. Do we, are we really utilizing what we have? So it could be looking at that applicant tracking system and saying, what automation is there? Is there anything that we could be doing there? Or, mm -hmm. you know, can I, um, it, it, do we need a new one or do we need an addition to, right? Like right now, like if you don't have a text messaging system um, for you, um, especially if you're hiring in bulk, you, you're, you you know, that that's one thing that can save you so much time and, and effort. Um, so that you can get a hold of people, for example, like that's one technology I would be looking at if I was mm. a HR department of one. And let's say I'm in manufacturing, um, I would be like, I need something to help me with text messaging people. Um, I can't just use my phone all day, you know, like that, that's not going to right. cut it. So, you know, so I'd be looking at that. How can I use those to the fullest? And let's say that's still not enough. You're still overworked and um, exhausted, <laughs> um, burnt out. Um, that's when I would be looking at this. And there's an amazing book called The Big Leap. And it has this concept that I really, I, I truly believe in, where you have these different levels of, I guess, competency. So there's the, um, they're called zones. So zone of incompetence, which means you can't do it. Like you have no knowledge. I can't ice skate. Never going to, that's a zone of competences for me as an example. <laughs> then there's zone of competence. You know how to do it, something you can do, but you're not really excited about it. That's laundry for me. I can totally do laundry. I know I need to do laundry, but I'm never going to own a laundry mat. The third level is your zone of mm -hmm. um, expertise. You can do this in your sleep, right? This is stuff that, you know, that's recruiting for me. I can do that in my sleep. I've been doing it for 20 years but it's not my passion anymore, okay? And then there's your zone of genius. And that's where you take that expertise and you love it and you nourish, nourish it and you just like, oh, I just wanna be in this all the time. And so I, I would be looking at that saying, okay, what's my zone of genius? I wanna try to get in that space as much as I can. I understand I'm gonna have to do zone of competence. So that'd be like payroll. Like I know I'm gonna have to do payroll if I'm an employee, uh, HR, office of one, right? That, but I might be able to outsource some of that or, you know, so I would look at my zone of genius first and say, this is where I really want to spend most of my time. And then look at what, you know, probably the, I would try to get a, rid of some of your zone of expertise just because it, it doesn't light you up anymore um, and try to delegate that in some way. And so that could be a person that could be a technology that could be outsourcing. It could be giving it back to the business. Right. Um, and then these are the things I have to do that, that mm -hmm. are required. You know, this, I have to do these pieces. Um, so I would just really look at those pieces and see how can you delegate or, or add something to kind of take away those pieces to help you as well as your, your team be in those areas. Cause what's really cool is your zone of genius is not the same as anyone else on your team. I guarantee they have, they have a, something else. They have something else they're passionate answer. about. Or it could be that you both have it and that's where you collaborate, but there's other pieces that you delegate. Right. And how would you say that that changes as you move between organizations, which we know people are seldom staying in the same place for much longer than two to four years, depending on the industry. How, how not, I guess the question is like a two-part question. How do these... Uh, zones of knowledge 
change. And I will make sure to link the book in the show notes for everyone too. I haven't read it yet, but I remember from our first conversation that I have to read it. And so this has reminded me that I have to read it. Um, but how, how do zones of knowledge change for us as we continue to grow and we put ourselves in more of that zone of genius uh, frame of reference? Like, does that change? And then the other thing, the other question, I guess, is how do organizations adapt to ensuring that their employees are between these zone of competence, zone of expertise, zone of genius, while also maintaining the growth of the organization? Because naturally, we're always going to have to do some things that we don't really enjoy doing, like you mentioned. So I guess just, uh, I think that th- how does that all kind of tie yeah, in I, together? I, I think it's two parts. So if you're looking at it in a career perspective, your zone of genius can absolutely change. I would say, you know, 10 years ago, my zone of genius was recruiting. I was still super passionate about it. I still loved it so much. And I was so excited about being a part of this industry that just kept evolving <laughs> and changing because that's what was happening around that time. Um, so so th- it can absolutely mm-hmm. change. I think when you're looking at transitioning, I would be looking at what are some of the zone of genius that you're not doing today that you want to do? And I would want to really ensure that that's in my next job. So it might help you with understanding what that next step is for you um, professionally. And so, you know, for me, you know, when I was in corporate America, um, you know, my next zone of genius was ownership of a company and, and being an entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, obviously I couldn't stay at my corporate job if I really thought that was my next step. Um, but I also wasn't perfect at it. I wasn't an expert, but it was definitely still my zone of genius because that's where I wanted to go. Um, So, you know, really, you know, that's where I think as a professional, you have to be willing to, you know, maybe yearly look at, you know, what you want to do, like what excites you, because it does, it can absolutely change. And with technology, oh my gosh, how, I mean, there's Mm -hmm. so much cool technology out there. Like right now, like for the past, I would say year and a half, I have been like totally nerding on Canva.com. I truly believe I am now a... I think I'm a graphic designer now. Like oh, I, 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 I want to, and, and it's been so much fun <laughs> learning it and being a part of that. Right. And I would have never said that was, was something I was interested in two or three years ago. Um, so technology can also like bring out things that you didn't even know you mm-hmm. loved. Um, so, so that's something as a career. Now looking at it in an organization perspective, I think it'd be kind of cool if the job description even had the zones on it. Like I want someone who has zones of genius and, you know, workplace, you know, um, workforce planning strategy, oh. right? Like that's where I want this person to shine. Like that's the shining moment for them. And then, yeah, you're, you know what I mean? Like kind of build that oh, out. That. And then that way it, and it can evolve, right? I mean, why does a job description have to go with a job title? Could a job description go with a person? Like could a person and their leader create their job description together in that zone of the zones? And then that way it can continue to evolve just like the businesses. You know what I mean? Like so many times like we're like, oh, we got to create a new job description because, you know, Tracy, Tracy's now doing this. So we need to add it to our, you know, that's a different job title. You know, why do we Mm -hmm. need titles? I don't know. This is getting too probably it's a lot. (laughs) But, you know, like this, I know I'm like, why can't it just be my title is Jody? And I'm the Jody of this organization. And I do this, like, this is my zone of genius today, but tomorrow my zone of genius is something else. I mean, I think that, um, we're so again, kind of that black and white kind of feel in an organization. And I know there has to be some of that. I know like, to me, it's like, we can't be a hundred percent in our zone of genius or like, I won't have any clothes to wear because I won't do laundry. Right. Like I have to do my zone of competence in order to be in my zone of genius. But if we can be 60, 70, 80% in our zone of genius, we are going to be happier, more engaged, you know, people, um, professionally and personally. Um, so, so I think that that could be a really interesting way. Oh my gosh. I feel like I should go to the big leap author and be like, I have a great idea for you. (laughs) You should make job descriptions. <laughs> yeah, because, I, I mean, because that would—I th- I think you should tell yeah. try tell teach them right. how they can make do a job, job description with the zones. Because 
I think organizations, you know, that's the one thing is there's, there's some pieces to HR that are very, um, you know, maybe they need to shift or change or evolve. And I think job descriptions is one. I think we've been shifting or evolving performance management a lot in the the past couple of years and not making it just a yearly thing. Um, but yeah, I think there's definitely some key areas that if someone's super smart, so if you're super smart out there and have an idea about making job descriptions make sense, do it. We need it. We totally need it in our industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I love that. I think actually that's a perfect place for us to stop because it's making me think so differently about how I've even thought about job descriptions and, and job creation, workforce planning, all of the above. So I love that. Thank you so much for all of your insight and ideas and uh, philosophies. I think we all are probably leaving this podcast with a lot of new inspiration for how we have approached sometimes the mundane parts of our day to day, unless writing job descriptions and creating, you know, job titles is your, you know, zone of genius, then in that case, you're probably loving this conversation even more. Um, but Jody, why don't you tell all the listeners where they can learn more about you, learn more about your books Absolutely. and your company I'm and, an and avid where LinkedIn they can user. So please feel free to connect. I do accept all connections on LinkedIn. And then if you are interested in learning more about, about design thinking um, by designbrainery.com and brainery is B-R-A-I-N-E-R-Y.com. If you're hesitant and want to learn, there's a free candidate persona course out there to help you with um, really truly understanding your candidate. Um, so it's a great freebie that you can do just to learn about the about the academy. And, um, and my company is um, by yeah, I already said that by designbrainery.com. Um, the books are all on Amazon. I, I truly believe that I should not be a logistics person. So I do appreciate delegating my cells to Amazon for the book. Yes. I love it. Amazing. And I will have all of that linked in the show notes. So fear not, you can just click the show notes and click all of those links and connect with Jody. Jody, thank you so much for being our first design thinking philosopher. Um, I will the take it that's in what a I'll heartbeat. Today, I might have to change okay. my LinkedIn tag to say that. I love it. But this has been, <laughs> this has been, this has been a great conversation. I love your podcast. I, I love, love these ideas and, and twisting and turning on HR and, and trying oh, to you. discover how we can make this a better industry. I love HR and I want us to be the best industry we can be. <laughs> yes. Amen to that. Thank you so much, Jody. You're welcome back anytime, of course. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll chat soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, just before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you are the first to hear when an episode drops each week. And maybe leave a five-star review and a comment about how much you loved this episode. Plus, if you have someone in mind who would really enjoy this episode, make sure you share it with them. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you next week.